In my last video, I dove into general piracy and media ownership in general, covering everything from music to movies to, of course, the popular subject today, video games. Today, I want to go deeper into one specific piece of that puzzle, the Stop Killing Games movement, and more specifically, the way it's been misrepresented by some, including Pirate Software. I've also got a few broader critiques of Pirate Software beyond SKG that I wanted to address that I didn't really get into last video, based on what I've seen over time and gathered from others in the industry. If you missed that last video, there's a card above. You definitely should check it out. It gives important context for today's conversation. Now, while I'm not a game dev, I am a cybersecurity professional who likes games that also has years of experience thinking about long-term systems planning. This movement ties directly into concepts we use in the field, like BCPDR, or business continuity planning, and disaster recovery. And we'll break down what that means shortly. So let's clear up some misconceptions with a bit of clarity and technical insight from my experience, because uh, a lot of people assume cybersecurity is just about firewalls and passwords, but it's honestly broader than that. It revolves often with the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And yes, at times it even involves physical security considerations at times. I'm not here to stir up drama, but to offer a clearer view from someone who's dealt with these concepts in the real world and understands how they apply even beyond traditional IT environments. So whether you're a dev, a gamer, or just someone who doesn't wanna see games you paid for vanish, this one's for you. And by the way, if all of this is interesting to you, along with digital rights, cybersecurity, gaming on Linux, amateur radio, including ham, CB, Meshtastic, and more, and Linux in general, then follow me here and on all of my socials. I often share updates, live streams, gaming on Linux, and cybersecurity content you won't find on many other places. I like to do a little bit of blending of cybersecurity with gaming and, you know, digital rights, so that's your jam. Stick around and consider even joining the Discord of Matrix. All right, let's dig into the Stop Killing Games movement from a cybersecurity lens, and... From this perspective, it's important to recognize that continuity and end-of-life planning isn't just a tech convenience. It's a security expectation. And specifically, this speaks to the availability piece of the CIA triad we often will refer to. And again, that's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If a game becomes completely inaccessible due to poor planning, that's a failure of availability. And thus is a failure of cybersecurity, believe it or not. And this often touches directly on something we often deal with in the field, as I mentioned before, called BCPDR. You've probably seen a lot of debate about what SKG is actually asking for, and there's been pushback not just from individual creators like Pirate Software, but also indus industry lobby groups. And recently, a notable example is the statement put out by Video Games Europe, a major trade association, which we will go into. But first, let's read what they said word for word. We appreciate the passion of our community. However, this decision to discontinue online services is multifaceted, never taken lightly, and must be an option for companies when an online experience is no longer commercially viable. We understand that it can be disappointing for players, but when it does happen, the industry ensures that players are given fair notice of this perspective of this perspective changes in compliance with local consumer protection laws. Private servers are not always a viable alternative option for players as the protections we put in place for secure player's data, remove illegal content, and combat unsafe community content would not exist and would leave rights holders liable. In addition, many titles are designed from the ground up to be online only. In effect, these proposals would curtail developer choice by making these games prohibitively expensive to create. We welcome the opportunity to discuss our position with policymakers and those who have led the European Citizens Initiative in the coming months. Let's break that down. First, remember that everyone in Video Games Europe, if I haven't made it clear, is directly tied to the same studios and publishers whose practices have been under fire for years. Their statement misrepresents what Stop Killing Games is asking for, much like Pirate Software did, and leans heavily on fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Claiming that community continuity equals privacy or security risks is a rather big fallacy. What SKG is asking for isn't indefinite support. It's about having a proper exit plan. That's a big difference. We're talking about the ability to continue a game through single player, LAN, or community hosted servers once official support ends. This isn't hypothetical either. Games like Tribes 2, Battlefield 2, and Halo Custom Edition are proof that this works. And of course, Minecraft 
is the gold standard. Its entire multiplayer ecosystem thrives on community-hosted servers. And here's where I want to tie in a concept that's well understood in cybersecurity that I mentioned earlier, business continuity planning and disaster recovery, or BCPDR as it's easier to just say. My role may not be focused solely on those disciplines, but I've been involved in it plenty. When a service goes down, a good org has a plan, a path forward, not just scrambling in the aftermath as we often see in the gaming industry. That's all SKG is really asking for. Continuity, not infinite support. Just don't lock people out of what they paid for when you shut things down. Give them options. And I can't help but laugh a bit at the argument that private risk servers are somehow too risky to allow, knowing that's originally where gaming came from. I've run my own email server, yes, really for over a decade, and there's a reason the joke goes friends don't let friends run their own email servers, but I did it. I also first had my uh, hosting experience with Tribes 2, and if it wasn't for that experience as a kid hosting my own server out of my house, I would have not learned a lot of the core concepts, port allowances, and how you need to deal with NAT and everything there to actually eventually lead me into the career I have today. But I did it. I also run my own Mastodon instance, self-host parts of my home lab, both on-prem and in the cloud, and I've even got a video on that mail server mess I will link up top. Yes, managing your own stuff has challenges, but for many of us, it's worth it. We value control, customization, and ownership, and that's exactly what's being taken away with these games shut down with no off-ramp. In fact, I've talked about eventually setting up a Tribes 2 Ultra XL server, tuned for big 16 versus 16, or even 32 versus 32, capture the flag matches with tons of maps, because I can because someone should. And this movement ensures this kind of passion doesn't get snuffed out. Now, I'll be the first to admit, running your server own servers isn't always easy, but for many of us, that is the point. The challenge is part of the reward. Just like I've said before, I run my own CV email server in the past because I can, and even made a whole video about that chaos. The real question becomes, if you're shutting down a game entirely, removing all ability for others to carry the torch, what's the issue? Because it's not about security. It's not about cost. It's about control. Speaking of security, if developers actually cared about user safety, they'd stop pushing kernel-level anti-cheat software. That stuff runs at ring zero, and I've got a whole video on why I think that's dangerous. I'll drop a card for that too. The same studios trying to fearmonger about private servers are shipping software with way more risk baked in. And let me tie this back to real world experience. Back in July 2024, the CrowdStrike outage crippled businesses around the globe, but not the company I work for. Why? BCPDR. We had a plan. I talked about it in my first YouTube video, broken thumbnails generated by AI that are horrible and all. We had users back online the same day. Some companies, they were down for a week or more. That's the difference planning makes. We're not asking for studios to keep gaming uh, uh, games online forever. We're asking them to think ahead, to give the community a chance to carry the torch when they move on. That's what responsible stewardship looks like. In my last video, I showed Tribes 2, a purely multiplayer game that's still thriving online after 24 years. Exactly the kind of model SKG advocates. Sure, there's not nearly the thousands of players that were once on it, but there are still players on it. And I hope one day, I think it's Midair is gonna be the spiritual successor one day that comes out and does as well to carry on the spirit. But until then, we do have Tribes 2, and here's some footage from my recent Twitch stream showing Tribes 2 alive and kicking. The community is hosting the servers, proving SKG's model isn't some unrealistic fantasy, and it's pre-existed them actually having this movement. The game, as you saw, we quickly installed this through Linux, and uh, using Lutris, and this game is older than some of you watching this video. This is how Stop Killing Games could ideally work where 
control is handed over. And then you can get right into playing a game. And as you can see, we're in. We're jet padding, jet packing around. Got my spin fuser. Now, if you don't remember this game, And that's Tribes 2. 24 years after it's released. But this is how stop killing games could actually work. Let me be clear. I've never really followed pirate software all that closely. Like many of you, I've seen his videos pop up on TikTok, YouTube Shorts, or reference in other commentary channels. I haven't been a fan, but I also haven't cared enough to dig into him much until recently. And it wasn't just one thing. It's that I've always had this weird discomfort watching his content. Something just felt off. I've even mentioned it during a few live streams. I don't wish him ill will, and I don't have any animosity toward him. I just had a gut feeling. That said, I'll also admit I could be wrong. I haven't experienced much of his content directly, and I know from first-hand experience how people can misjudge others based on a TikTok or a YouTube short. That's why I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt, but I also didn't care enough to go digging. Still, the more I looked, the more things didn't quite line up. A great example is a video that went viral from a creator called the Slop News Network. Despite that silly name, which I did chuckle at, the video was actually a really well done takedown of Pirate Software's claims, particularly from a game dev perspective. They pointed out several inconsistencies in what appear to be fibs in his storytelling. I'll link that video below if you want to dig deeper. But for this video, we're staying in my lane, the cybersecurity side of things. From what I've gathered, a lot of his so-called cybersecurity experience seems to center around website security and some social engineering engineering, which don't get me wrong, are valid things that we need in cybersecurity. But I haven't seen him dive into red team tooling, blue team response, or infrastructure level strategy. If that content exists, I haven't seen it and neither have any of the cybersecurity folks that I've been asking around. Editing chief here. So I realized something after I recorded, I forgot to touch more on the DEF CON black badge part. See, part of the issue is Pirate Software's claim that Mr. Robot stole part of his work from DEF CON puzzles for their show, except there's a big problem with that story. Those puzzles were team efforts, not solo projects. And even more importantly, one of the actual writers of Mr. Robot was Jeff Moss, also known as DT, The Dark Tangent. He's not only involved in the show, but he's literally the founder of DEF CON and Black Hat. So I'm really struggling to believe that storyline. Like I said earlier, this just keeps reinforcing my feeling that some of his claims might be a little embellished. That said, don't get me wrong, even being part of a black badge winning team is a huge honor, but individual credit is hard to measure when it's a group effort. Anyway, back to the rest of the video. Now, let's talk about the infamous VPN claim, which I talked about in the last video, because it is kind of an important one when talking overall about his cybersecurity knowledge. He said VPN is never a security tool. Let's roll the clip so you can hear it for yourself. Just watched your short saying VPN doesn't make you safer. Then what does? VPN is not a security product. It is never going to be a security product. If you want to be safer on what you are doing, stop logging into critical accounts that you have on public access internet. Don't do that. Ever. Ever at all. It is not a security product. That's just incorrect. Sure, VPNs are often oversold, as I've even said. And I have an entire video, which you can see above, where I've talked about how VPNs are not magic silver bullets and people are overestimating what they can do. But they're definitely oversold in ads targeting casual users, and a lot of people buying them for the wrong reasons. But to say they're never a security tool, that flies in the face of basic networking and cybersecurity principles. Are there insecure VPN configurations or outdated protocols? Of course, 
but we don't need to get into the weeds of OpenVPN versus WireGuard or IPsec or the differences between a proxy and a VPN to understand the basics. VPNs do serve a legitimate and important role in network defense, especially now that we're transitioning from traditional VPNs to zero trust network access, but that's a diatribe for another day. You can host your own VPN. I've done it when I travel, so you can safely route traffic back through your own trusted infrastructure while on public and untrusted networks. And enterprises use site-to-site -site VPNs every single day to securely connect office networks, cloud environments, and remote infrastructure. In in infrastructure. That's not marketing fluff. That's security architecture 101. And you don't have to take my word for it. This is literally in the Certified Information System Security Professional study materials. There's an entire section dedicated to VPNs under secure network design. It's right here, chapter and verse. For those unfamiliar, CISSP is a certification you can only earn after five years of professional field experience, four if you've got a four-year degree. It might be the only cert I've bothered with in my decade-long career, but when it comes to core principles like this, I can confidently say, I know what I'm talking about. And yeah, I've made a video about certifications too. I offer advice for folks breaking into cybersecurity, and I talk about why I emphasize real-world experience over collecting a bunch of paper. That's a part of why the CISSP is the only one I've kept up with, I'll throw a card up for that video if you want to check that out. I also hold a ham radio license in case anyone's curious. I got into it not just for emergency communications, but to better understand the art and science of radio. It helped me make sense of all kinds of wireless tech, from Wi-Fi to antennas to RF protocols. I even have a video on that too, covering ham, CB, mesh-tastic, and more. I'll drop a card for that as well. And I'm currently studying for the Certified Cloud Security Professional CCSP to deepen my knowledge around secure architecture and cloud environments. But now let's shift back to code. I'm not a professional developer. I mostly write in PowerShell, Bash, Python, and I've been working in ter with Terraform and OpenTofu and uh, for infrastructure as code. Uh, but even with my modest skills, I still publish useful tools. I built a small project called Twitch and Toot, which runs on a Raspberry Pi and sends a toot to Mastodon when I go live. Someone even contributed a patch to make it work with Blue Sky, which I still need to review once Blue Sky actually implements proper OAuth and MFA, because I don't want to rework it again, especially since I'd love to use my YubiKeys with it. You know, these little guys. I love these little secure guys. I'm not the strongest coder in the world, but I put my work out there and I've had others build on it. That's part of what community is all about. So when I look at someone like Pirate Software, someone with a massive platform and who presents themselves as a longtime security pro, and I see a GitHub with no repositories, not even forks, just feels weird. Hopefully that is his account. Most people I know in InfoSec, even those who don't know code much, have something public. It's part of how we collaborate, contribute, and learn from each other. Now, I could be wrong, because I'm not spending weeks tearing apart his entire content backlog. But if I'm mistaken, I'll be the first to say so. See? That's not hard. Accountability matters. That's how we grow. Look, I get it. Some people resonate with Pirate Software's delivery. He's charismatic. He knows how to connect with his audience. But in technical fields like cybersecurity, accuracy, and humility matter. Misrepresenting fundamental concepts, even unintentionally, leads people down the wrong path. And in this space, that has real consequences. As professionals, one of the most important things we can do is recognize our strengths, acknowledge our limits, and own our mistakes. That's not weakness. It's how you grow. It's how you build trust. The Stop Killing ba Games movement isn't asking for the impossible. It's uh, not about forcing studios to run servers forever. It's about responsible digital stewardship. It's about making sure the things we've paid for, games, art, software, don't just vanish the moment they're no longer profitable. In cybersecurity, we plan for this. We call it business continuity planning and disaster recovery. Why should game preservation be treated any differently? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, whether you agree, disagree, or have your own stories to share. If you enjoyed this breakdown, hit the like button, subscribe, and consider joining our community here and on social media. As I've said, I post about cybersecurity gaming on Linux, digital rights, and all the self-hosted chaos you'd expect from someone running their own Mastodon server. Thanks for watching, and until next time, happy hacking.